If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Otherwise, in your sheet that you picked up at the front door, I've got the text that I'll be addressing this evening printed there for you, so either one. This evening we've gathered to celebrate the coming of a king, the coming of a priest, the coming of a prophet. And each of those facets of his ministry and his service on this earth was referenced this evening as we sang and as we read and as we contemplated. This evening I want to look at Isaiah that sort of brings all of what we've looked at together into one nice little package for us, keeping it rather simple. And I want to talk with you about a white Christmas. So um, Isaiah chapter 1, I'm going to read 10 through 18. That actually is the text. The primary text will be 18, but the passage is 10 through 18. So I'm going to read it. This is indeed God's word. It's the word of a king. And uh, therefore, let me invite you to stand together with me out of reverence and respect for the reading of God's word, the word of this king. Hear now the words of King Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That's far the reading of the words of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, what a delight it is to gather here this evening and indeed gather for this incredible blessing that is ours in the coming of you, our God, to this earth to redeem a people to yourself. Lord, to redeem a bride. And Lord, we are so privileged this evening to come before you with eyes to see and ears to hear and understand what that means. We love you, Lord. We pray you'd now condescend again and meet with us and enable us to understand as we gaze upon your word here. God, open hearts that are closed, open eyes that are blind, open ears that are deaf. May the blind and the deaf leap for joy that this day might be a day where there's celebration and glory as we rejoice over the salvation of just one. We praise you, Lord, and pray you bless this night towards that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. A White Christmas. Most of you have heard that song. I can't imagine anyone here who hasn't heard that song, A White Christmas. But you may not know the background of that song. Irving Berlin is rumored to have written it on a beach in July. Um, and uh, whether or not that's true or not is debated. But what is not debated is that once it was written, he gave it to some of the most famous and popular singers of, that, of his time. And every one of them rejected that song. It was schmaltzy. It was viewed as being quaint and being a little... Um, uh, old-fashioned, 
It was, uh, many thought it would never be a good hit, and yet eventually it landed on the desk of Bing Crosby, and you know the rest of the story. It's now one of the most popular Christmas songs um, in the world um, uh, 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 out of date. Now, there are others as well that would vie uh, for that, but it's a very uh, popular song, A White a Christmas. Are you dreaming of a white Christmas? The passage that we just read teaches us how we as God's people, we as people, can enjoy a white Christmas. Yet, the white is not in reference to snow in this text. The white is in reference to being people who no longer have sin. Think about that. Every one of us here are sinners. And every one of us someday is going to stand before God Almighty, the judge, the king. And we will render account for all that we have done. All the bad. Imagine knowing that on that day, you could stand before that king and have him say, innocent, not guilty. That's what this passage is talking about. That's the white Christmas. This evening, I want to look with you at this white Christmas under two heads. One is that a white Christmas from this text, very clear, cannot be manufactured. Would you notice with me verse 10? Isaiah uh, begins. Let me give you a quick background before I read verse 10. Isaiah was written around 750, 740 B.C., 740 B.C., at a high point in uh, the nation of Judah. From 798 all the way down to 740, 739, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdoms were in their heyday. It was the most wealthiest time. Most wealthiest. Sorry for that double. It was the wealthiest time that God's people had ever known since Solomon. Um, The borders were as big as they ever could be under Solomon. And so it was this time of wealth and this time of um, where God's people were not afraid of any foes outside. They weren't afraid of Babylon. They weren't afraid of the Assyrians. They weren't afraid of the Egyptians. They were free to pursue all the kinds of arts and leisure and pleasures that wealthy nations can do uh, today. And they did. And during this time, religion, Judaism was at its peak from the outside looking in. People were flocking to the temple. There were more people attending worship on a typical Sabbath day than ever before. It was this incredible high time, great time. And that brings us then to verse 10 with Isaiah writing in 740. And he wrote this to God's people. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, you, if you know much about the Bible, you've heard of Sodom and uh, Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a group of cities um, on the south um, east side of the Dead Sea that was known for their wickedness and rebellion. And so God came at the time of, of Abraham and he warned them they did not repent, so fire uh, rain down from heaven and completely destroyed those cities. Those names that from that point on would be known, would be associated with wickedness and sickness, spiritual sickness and deceit. So when God comes through Isaiah and addresses the people of God's leaders as the leaders of Sodom and the leaders of Gomorrah, that should make you sit up and realize God's not happy with his people. He's calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, what's amazing, it wasn't because God's people weren't trying. If you notice with me, just walk with me real quickly. Verse 11, just gaze at it as I talk. The people were offering incredible sacrifices during this time. Burnt offerings. The fat of fed cattle. That is perhaps the best offering imaginable. A wealthy offering. They were offering it. Multiple sacrifices, the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. Verse 13, the people were offering incense. They were observing holy days that God had ordained. New moons, Sabbaths, assemblies. 
verse 14. They were also observing the appointed feast. Now, if you know much about Old Testament Judaism worship and the calendar, you know there were a lot of feasts. They were observing them all. They wouldn't miss them. Not for the world. Verse 15, the people were, are praying diligently because the way that the text reads in verse 15, even though they multiplied prayers, they prayed and they prayed. This was a high point. If you were living at that time, you think, man, oh man, Judaism has never seen a better day. Look at all of those people, the money that's coming in, all of the sacrifices and service. Man, what a wonderful time to be alive. And yet, as you and I read this this evening, we saw God clearly was not happy with his people at this time. We read verse 11. God had had enough of the burnt offerings. Verse 13, again, just scan through it as I read these verses. God calls them worthless offerings. Verse 14, God says he hates their religious celebrations and was weary of them. Verse 15b um, God would therefore hide his eyes from their prayers. Now you read this passage and you go and you look, you look at the context and you go, what's God's problem? I mean, <laughs> from the outside you'd say, God, this is the height, the pinnacle of Judaism going on right now. Imagine every seat in this place filled and people standing outside waiting to get in. We'd be thinking, man, God's, God's doing incredible work here. And yet at this time, God comes to the prophet Isaiah and says, I just wish you'd stop it. I'm sick of your feasts. I'm sick of your prayers. What's God's problem? Well, we start to get an idea in verse 16. Notice what we read there. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphans, plead for the widow. Well, you know what God's problem is at this time? And it's a shocker to us because we have this idea that in the context of religion, God is thrilled when God's people offer sacrifices. And God is, is pleased when God's people pray. And he's happy and overjoyous when, when God's people come and offer lavish gifts. And all of that we call religion. And brothers and sisters, where those gifts and offerings and service and sacrifices are given by people whose hearts are filthy, dirty with sin... The sacrifices are repulsive to God. Think about that. Imagine as a parent, you got two kids. And the older kid spends the afternoon torturing his younger brother. Right? Tying him up, shooting water in his face, throwing darts, you know, shooting his dart gun at him, having it stick in his fa on his face. I mean, just tormenting his brother. And you've left him to be the babysitter. And you come back after three or four hours to discover your, your younger child bruised and crying and sad. But your older boy brings you a card that says, Mother, Dad, I love you. Would you come in and say, Oh, forget the younger brother. You love me. Give me a huge hug. You wouldn't. You come in and say, you know, this card doesn't mean much when you're hating your younger brother the way that you've done. we got a problem here. That's what God's people were doing. They were doing all the external things that God wanted them to do. These external things that God set up that we, God's people, might enjoy God. They were doing all these religiously external things, but their heart was far from God. In fact, God's word here says in 16, they were dirty, wash themselves. They were, they were filthy, make yourselves clean. They were guilty of foul revolt. Remove the evil of your deeds. I mean, in verse 15, if you look at it, they weren't literally lifting up bloodied hands. But because of the way they were living six days out of the week, they were being mean and hurting people. They had blood all over their hands, figuratively speaking. And in those hands, they were lifting up to God saying, Oh God, we love you so much. Yet God's word says, if you, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. 
Because you can't love, love your brother whom you've seen, or you can't hate your brother whom you've seen, and not love God whom you haven't seen. It's impossible, because your brother has been made in the image of God. So God comes and says to these people who are relying upon their, or really bet, or really enjoying their religious ceremonies, enjoying being religious. He comes and says, shut the door because your religion is without substance. Boy, I look around our culture today, our society, that I think well, this is so characteristic of us. We are so wealthy. The church is filled, in many places, filled to overflowing because we love we love coming and thinking we're honoring God. God is this being up in the heavens who just enjoys our ceremonies and our prayers. When in reality, brothers and sisters, ceremonies and prayers are not God's delight. His delight, as we'll see, is the fellowship with you, his people. And so here, as well as in Matthew, we read the same exact message. Listen to Matthew 7. Many will say to me on the last day, this is the end time when Jesus Christ comes back as the judge. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Listen to what they're doing. Prophesying. Casting out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, brothers and sisters, if you've got sin in your heart, that is repulsive to God. Do you understand that? God is a being who's holy. And sin is repulsiveness to, uh, to him. In fact, God's standard to have a relationship with you and me, you know how, how high it is? Matthew 5, uh, 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect, Jesus said. You're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you're not perfect this evening, if you don't have a perfect record this evening, you're going uh, to hell. That's harsh. I know that sounds harsh. But it's not harsh to tell the truth, hopefully graciously. If you've got sin, one sin, if you're not perfect, if you're short of perfect, you will be the people whom God says, be gone from me. I never knew you. But God, we prayed and I went to church and I did all these good things. I was a good person outside of church. Yes, but your heart is far from me. Be gone. I never knew you. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize we have this idea that God, we, and, we, and we, we get it from movies and from the books we've read, that God is like the Greek gods who sit up in heaven and are basically bored, and they watch man for their entertainment. And as they watch man, when they see a really, really devout individual, they see someone who's really devoted to them, it's sort of a complimentary. And so that they go, you know what? You're a good guy. And because you're a good guy, I like you. And when, and when you die, you're going to be with me. That's how we view God. But you know what that is? That's a contemporary. That's not God. God is, is described in Scripture just three chapters later as holy. We read that the angels who are without sin stand before God in Isaiah 6 and cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy. He's without sin. God's standard when it comes to salvation, God's standard when it comes to us, his uh, people, um, or better yet, he's so holy, not just his standard, but he's so holy. This is why his standard is so high because Exodus 33 says, no man can see me and live. Hear that f phrase. God said, no man on this side of the grave, can see me and live. That's how awesome God is. God is a being that is awesome. Holy means he's different from us. Not only is he morally perfect, but he's, he's not creation. He's transcendent. He's above creation because he created it. That's how awesome God is. That's how big God is. And so to think that this being would sit there and be amused or entertained because we're praying. And, and then to have him go, oh, he's such a devout person, so uh, sincere, uh, come on up, is to make him into one of us. God's standards, as we just saw, is perfection. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you can only have it if you're perfect. Do you understand this? This is huge. Thus... 
God told Samuel to tell Saul, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Do you think God's delight delights in burnt offerings and sacrifices and prayers and, and religious uh, ceremonies? Those are just the means to fellowship with God. If you're not fellowshipping with God, all of those are empty and worthless. God says, says the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to submit to my word, to heed, is um, better than the fat of rams. That's what God's after. Perfect people. Perfect uh, a people without sin. And that, brothers and sisters, is why God came to this world. So from this, I want you to see the first point. You cannot manufacture a Christmas. All of the religious activities we could ever think that we could do will not make God pleased if you're missing the substance. So a white, Christian, a white Christmas cannot be manufactured. It can only be imparted. Now this is the amazing, this is the greatest news your ears will ever hear in this world. Verse 18, notice with me. We read, come now, God's response, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. In the Hebrew, which is what this was originally written in, such intimate words, come to me and let's dialogue. Think about this. If you, what what I've just described about God would make you want to run, right? When Adam sinned, what did he do? He ran from God. Everything I just described right now would make you and I think, if that's true, then I don't want to stand before this God because I'm going to be damned. I'll be uh, condemned. I'm running from this God. In fact, what am I doing here? Get out of this building. I don't want to be here. This God's scary. But do you know what? This God, the real God, not the gods of Zeus or Zeus or all the different Greek gods, but the real God, this real God far from at this moment in your life, damning you or condemning you this God says come to me and let's dialogue he's condescended to you right now and he's saying let's talk let's dialogue let's talk about your sinful heart don't hide it that won't fix it let's talk about what you're struggling with notice he says come let us reason together says the Lord Now notice, what will be the result of this dialogue? Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Scarlet, red in the Bible is pictured as sin. It's it's, it's, in why is red and scarlet the picture of sin? Because to pay for sin in the Bible, you had to kill an animal, shed its blood. So red was the picture of death. Because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Though your sins deserve death. I'm going to make your record white as snow. Though they're red. Like crimson blood. You're going to be like white as wool. This is an amazing news brothers and sisters. This is a God. The only wise God. The only God. And his response right now to you. If you're sitting here going, man, I have fallen short. I'm not perfect. Therefore, on the day of judgment, I fear I will be the one who God says, be gone from me. I never knew you. I don't care what religious things that you've done. If that's you, do you understand that this moment in your life, this God condescends to your level. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus, God, becoming man, condescending, coming down to where we live. We just sang about it, brothers and sisters. Look at your green uh, sheet. Come thou long, expected. Third stanza. Come to earth to taste our sadness. That's why he wants to talk. He knows what you're going through. He whose glories knew no end, by his life he brings us gladness, our Redeemer, shepherd, friend, leaving riches without number, born within a cattle stall. This, the everlasting wonder, Christ was born the Lord of all. That's what Christmas is all about. God understanding that we fall short. So what does God do? He doesn't just turn his back and say, get out of here, you make me sick. 
He comes down to our level. He stoops. And he puts his arm around us. He says, let's reason. Let's talk here. And in the process of talking, he explains to you the most glorious transaction that you could ever be a participant, a, a participant in. And it's a transaction where Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, God, and did not sin, will give you his sinful record. I'm sorry, his righteous record. God, who came to this earth and did not sin, he'll give you his righteous record. And he will then take your sinful record upon him. That's why he says, though it's red, it'll be white. You get my record, I get yours. And that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died in your place for your sin. You may be this day a veritable angel, one who walks around and rarely sins, but all it takes is one sin to damn a soul to hell. And if you all are guilty of one sin, like I am, how glorious it is that Jesus Christ has come down and put his arm around me and said, and you, take my righteous record as your own. I'll take your sinful record. You've got the text in front of you, Revelation chapter 7. What does this mean? How does this happen? How does it work? Let me explain this and we'll wrap it up. Revelation 7 gives us uh, the answer. Speaking of those who endure during the end time, God's people, we read, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that incredible? God intended bloody hands to be cleansed by a bloody sacrifice, Jesus Christ. How does that work? How can bloody hands be clean, cleansed by a bloody sacrifice? It's incredible. The answer is very simple. Jesus Christ, well, let me back up to understand it, understand what God taught his people with the sacrificial system. You know how the Jews, they offer up lambs and animals, burnt offerings, they're all sacrifices. What was all that about? It was God teaching his people how to be saved. The way that you're saved in the Old Testament pictured was that when you sinned, there's nothing you could do but die. If I sin, I die. It's very clear. But God says, instead of dying, you can take a clean, a spotless lamb. Bring that little lamb to the, to the uh, temple gate and there, or tabernacle gate. There you will lay your hands on its head and say the sin that you're guilty of. God, I, I am guilty of, of breaking every commandment that you gave this week. I have had other gods before me, as, such as my money. I have lusted, I have stolen, I have et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you would confess your sins. And the picture is that you're transferring your sin to this spotless lamb. And then the priest would give you a knife. And you take that knife and you slit the lamb's neck, its throat. And the blood would come out. And they'd kill that lamb. And you'd know as a, sacrifice, as a worshiper, that's me. I've just transferred all my sin on it. And that's me. And that animal's dying because of my sin. And you leave having received that lamb's life. There's an exchange there going on. But Hebrews is very clear. That never saved anybody. But it was a picture of how God does save through Jesus Christ. When he came, his um, cousin, John the Baptist, when he saw him walk by, he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is that Lamb. And that's how God's people wash their hands in the blood of of the lamb. They go to him who has come to you. You don't have to flee. He's come to you and he's come to you and he's put his arm around you this evening and saying, come to me. I'll give you rest. Wash your hands in the sacrifice that, I, that I've given you on the cross of Jesus Christ. If you do that, what that means is you, you, this, this evening as we wrap this up, Bow before God. God, I'm guilty of one sin. And on the day of judgment, I will stand before you. And I will have to render account, explain about that sin, give an account for that sin. And I know on that day it will be judgment. So come before God this day and say, God, 
I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. Please give me the record of Jesus Christ. And if you pray that and you're relying upon that sacrifice, then brothers and sisters, the words of Acts 16 to 30, the jailer was brought out of prison and he said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the, and that means rely, rest upon, make that your reason for approaching God. Stop approaching God because of your religious ceremony. Stop approaching God because you think you've lived a good life. No, turn from self to Christ. Lay your hands upon that lamb. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Family of God, if you are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ this day, guess what? Not on my own authority, and it's not my opinion. It's fact based upon the word of God. If you're trusting in, G in the payment for your sin in Jesus Christ, that's the payment for your sin. You are perfectly spotless. You are perfect. You're spotless. You're white as wool. Do you understand that? And that will be a status that will never change. I read a couple weeks ago this great statement. You are either one of two people. You are either one who displeases God or you are one who pleases God. If you're in Jesus, you are one who pleases God. And that Christian will never change. Do you believe that? If you do, don't, I exhort you, don't be weary and heavy laden this, week, this year. Yeah, it's been a, a rough year. Lay it down. Rejoice this day in the most incredible message that any ear could ever hear. In Christ, you are spotless and clean. And God is thrilled with you. If you don't have Christ this day, come. It's not too late it, until you die. It's not too late for you to bow before Jesus and say, Christ, take my sin. I take your righteousness, and God will save you. Glory be to God. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that though our sins were as scarlet, in Christ they are they're now white. There is no sin. Though we were red like crimson, our record now is, is like wool. We be, stand before you this moment as a people forgiven. And what's amazing, O oh Lord, to me in this passage, it just shocks me and floors me, is to see your response to my sin, to our sin. It is not what we would think. Bony finger pointing upon us saying, get out of my sight. But it's this glorious call that begins with this, a warning. What you're doing is not pleasing. Come. Let us reason. God, I pray that this day, this evening, would be a moment when, when, when you would do that, that gracious call in the lives of, your, of, of the people here. That, Lord, you would draw near and, and call them to reason with you. And that you'd give them eyes to see and ears to hear. And that, Lord, they would, they would turn from self-reliance and, and the reliance upon religious ceremony and and, and their good deeds, and they would turn to the good deeds, to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where they would receive your right standing, Jesus, and where you indeed will say to them, I bore your sin on the cross. God, work redemptively. We pray this, this day, this moment, in the lives of the people listening, that we, your people, might rejoice today forevermore and may it therefore give us a rejoicing that would transcend the, the, the silly world uh, uh, worries of this world. And that, Lord, it would lead us to sit at your feet as Mary and not to be burdened and worried and bothered about so many things, which in glory, what will COVID be? What will an economy be? What will a job be? What will health be? What will all the concerns of this world be in election? They will seem as nothing to remember. But your work and your grace applied to your people, that is what will be celebrated 
and recounted and uh, glorified in heaven. God, grant us the grace as your people to make your glory, your grace, your cross our chief and highest reward. We pray this, O Lord, 